Okay, welcome to which is now the fifth edition of the Coffee Microcaps uh, Fund Manager Monthly, where we discuss uh, two stocks with one of the fund managers, which is in our uh, quarterly review. Uh, the December quarterly review is going to be coming out uh, very shortly, it might even be out before this video. We're just waiting for the last one or two numbers. But today I am joined by Mr. Peter Johns from. 300 uh, Capital, uh, soon to be uh, West Ferry. Uh, is it Capital or Management? Oh, West Ferry, uh, the West Ferry Fund. So it's West Ferry yeah. Investment Group. Okay. So I think that's a good place to start, Peter, because uh, you know your background is kind of quite different to uh, a lot of fund managers and uh, you've got a few things going on uh, at the fund level. So maybe just give us an overview of that before we, we get into the two stocks. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. I uh, definitely come to the industry from a, a different place to most. I'm a criminal lawyer by training and background, and I did that for about 15 years. And uh, most recently, I spent seven years as counsel assisting the state coroner in Queensland. So I ran inquests and uh, large scale court hearings, uh, which uh, inquired some quite in depth investigations. But um, my sort of passion, despite all the interest that that job created was uh, in stocks and, and over time that grew and I did sufficiently well with my own trading that uh, eventually I, um, with some difficulty, convinced my wife that it was a, a full-time option. Um, and on doing that, a, a number of friends asked me to manage the money for them. And that's how uh, my, my first fund called 300 Capital, uh, which was just a private, um, very small fund that started with $500,000 began. Uh, and so that's been going for four years. Uh, it's grown to its uh, full potential in that uh, we, we now have 50 investors, which is the most we could have under that private company structure. Um, the funds under management have grown up to around uh, 8 million. Uh, and, and we've done quite well over the last four years. And so uh, starting 1 January, we, uh, after some difficulty and, and, and uh, a lot of mucking around, got ourselves organised with an AFSL and uh, we now have an AFSL which allows us to take uh, funds uh, and, and invest on behalf of sophisticated uh, or wholesale investors uh, and that's what we've uh, begun to do. So it's not a, a traditional launch in the sense that we, we went out to, to raise money, it's essentially a continuation of the private fund but uh, as of 1 January we're able to take in outside money from, from people we don't know. Uh, and advertise the fund and, and all the things that an AFSL allows. So um, we have around $10 million now uh, to start West Ferry, uh, the West Ferry Fund, and uh, it will be a continuation of the same investment style that I've been running for the last four years with 300 Capital and many years before that with my own personal account. Okay, great. Well, let's uh, chat about, uh, I think, two interesting stocks. Uh, one, I didn't know you were a lawyer, but it's now uh, linked to your background. Um, but we'll, we'll keep that for, uh, for number two. So the first one we want to we wanna talk about is um, PTB Group. And um, just give us uh, an overview of, of PTB. You know, how do these guys make their money? Uh, PTB is a a company that is involved with small plane engines. So uh, there's a plane engine called the PT6A. It's the most common style of plane engine in the world. It's a turboprop engine. So it's, uh, it's an engine that uh, is made by Pratt & Whitney in Canada. It's been around 50 years. It's still the uh, most popular engine amongst a certain type of plane. Uh, and it will be around for another 30 or 40 or 50 years. Um, it is used on planes that tend to take only up to about 20 passengers. And indeed, it's not often used on passenger planes at all. It's used for things like uh, uh, aeromedical services, uh, for maybe uh, occasionally parachute um, planes, for freight planes uh, and uh, seaplanes, this type of thing. Uh, PTB uh, specialise in the... Uh, the MRO, it's called the, the maintenance, repair, and overhaul of those engines. Uh, they've been listed on the ASX for um, since around the GFC, uh, and they uh, make their money by uh, firstly doing the, the maintenance, repair, and overhaul of those engines, but also in trading parts. So they uh, 
uh, are experts in identifying cheap parts, which can be obtained anywhere around the world, uh, and using those parts to on sell or to use those parts to uh, build engines, which are then either on sold or leased to uh, to their customers. Uh, and that leads me to the final area that they make money, which is leasing. So they lease engines and they lease uh, some small planes to various uh, to various airlines. Okay, great. And uh, the kind of the, the overall uh, investment thesis. Um, you know, I I have seen you on Twitter uh, uh, talking about their, I guess, um, situation in relation to COVID. Uh, Obviously, this year, you know, everything airline, you know, took a took a nose dive. If we can use the yes. if we can use the pun, but um, you know, give us your kind of overall investment thesis uh, on PTB. Like, why do you like them? And you know, you continue to hold them, uh, you know, right through COVID. Even though to the to the untrained eye, you know, they should have been heavily impacted, a la Qantas, B, A, and 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 everything else linked to to air travel. Sure, um, I've, I've held them for a, a long time in, at, a, at a lower level. First of all, the, the management, the board and the CEO, Stephen Smith, own a, a large part of the stock, which is always something that I, I look for. Um, it's not enough on its own, but it, it's uh, a helpful pointer. Um, the, uh, going with that though, I, I would also say that I've found them to be a very well managed company for a long time. Uh, and so that, that's something which has always attracted me to them. Uh, one other area is that I've always found them to be a misunderstood co company. Um, the MRO business, which is based here in Brisbane, I think is an excellent business that has grown steadily year on year for, for the best part of uh, the last five or six years, but its results have been masked by uh, much more um, up and down results in other areas of the business in leasing and, uh, and another small um, business they own in Sydney called International Air Parts. Uh, and so there was always this call that I could see once you, uh, once you crunch the numbers that wasn't evident to the market. So that's what attracted it to me. Um, COVID threw up a, a, a bizarre situation where um, uh, because this company ostensibly was a, and of course is related to aviation, uh, it was hammered. So, I mean, this company in, in January last year uh, expanded by raising capital and bought a US uh, MRO business uh, to roll out the expertise that had, had stood them so well in, in Brisbane uh, into a US business. Uh, the, the capital raising was at 69 cents through Morgan's. Uh, people that applied couldn't even get 10% of what they asked for. It was so popular at that price. And yet because of COVID only six weeks later, uh, you couldn't give the shares away for, for you know, 30 cents uh, on some of the days in, in the middle of March. Uh, and that's because people just saw it as an aviation firm, aviation's dying, quick sell the shares. Um, but the reality was that um, the, the type of planes that they serviced were not the type of planes that were affected by COVID. And, and in many cases, uh, those type of planes benefited because of the, their use in things like uh, aeromedical services and freight. Uh, and the like. Um, the one catch to that was that their biggest client is a, is a company called Trans Maldivian Airways. It's the largest seaplane operator in the world. It's based in the Maldives, as the name suggests. Uh, and that was obviously one client and their biggest client that was was uh, very badly affected by the by COVID. But beyond that, uh, the rest of their business wasn't affected. And so that's what drew me into the stock much more. I, I bought heavily through that period and have done very well as it has recovered. Um, I still like it though, because it's uh, uh, still a recovery play. So, I mean, they're, they're still going through a, a fairly uh, rough patch compared to, to historically in the current half because of, of COVID, because of the, uh, the effects on their US business. I think uh, you'll see a, a reasonably soft half, but I see it uh, having enormous potential over time. Uh, the US business that board has three times the capacity, for instance, of the Brisbane workshop, but only turns over a similar amount in terms of uh, uh, the engines and, and the uh, the dollar amount. Uh, and so there's an enormous uh, efficiency gain to be to be obtained over there. Uh, and uh, so I see it as a growth story, a recovery story um, that will take it uh, you know, well beyond um, the, the current uh, recovery period. 
Okay. And I mean, key risks for the business uh, moving forward. I mean, obviously with all acquisitions, uh, especially international ones, you know, you've got the integration risk and, you know, once you get in there, finding a few skeletons falling out of the closet, um, you know, that one that would jump out with me. I mean, another one would be, I mean, they're servicing, you know, engines on behalf of uh, an OEM, you know, does the OEM not provide that service or they just provide it in certain geographic locations and, you know, they rely on people like PTB to, you know, service their engines on behalf of, you know, customers who are using it within those markets where they, where they don't have that service offering. Cool. Um, the first question, um, uh, in relation uh, well, sorry, I'll touch on the OEM uh, issue. Um, it, it's a good point. Oh, the uh, obviously Pratt and Whitney uh, sell these engines and then service them uh, themselves, and, and they hope to uh, engage customers to, to uh, service the engines through them. Um, one thing that assists PTB there is that uh, Pratt and Whitney engines or PT6A engines have been around so long. Uh, uh, so some of the engines they're, they're servicing. Uh, are 30, 40 years old and they're still perfectly uh, useful and operational and, uh, as long as they're continually overhauled. PDBs, I suppose a comparison to cars, right? If, if uh, you buy a, uh, a Toyota or uh, and you then go back to the Toyota shop to get it uh, um, fixed under warranty, uh, that's your returning to the OEM. PTB is more like uh, your high quality local mechanic who's not connected to the original manufacturer. What makes it a much better business though than your local mechanic is that uh, PTB must comply, of course, with the incredibly strict regulatory environment that uh, occurs in aviation. So they have to, if, if you go to PTB, you know you're going to get a, a very high level of service because uh, it's audited over and over and over again by uh, the FAA or the uh, comparable regulatory authority in each of the country they operate. And so there's um, not a particularly, um, no particular downside to, to using them over um, another MRO shop in terms of quality, uh, but they do manage to, to provide a cheaper cost than, than say Pratt and Whitney or the other OEMs. Um, so so that's, that's the benefit, that's what keeps them uh, getting customers. They tend to specialise in uh, remote airlines. So a lot of airlines in the Pacific, uh, in the Maldives, as you've heard, in remote parts of Australia, um, because they are not as uh, able to access OEMs as readily as, as other airlines who might be in, in major hubs. Um, so they service this niche and, and they, as a result, tend to have very sticky clients. They, they have clients that have been with them for 20, 30 years. Um, I mean, another example of that is the fact that uh, Trans Maldivian, which I discussed, is an airline that's been handed from one PE shop uh, to the next um, over the last two decades. And on each occasion, as you can imagine, a private equity outfit comes into these things and tries to, to cut costs as much as they can. And then uh, PTB has survived two reviews by two different private equity shops um, without having to reduce their fees. I mean, the, the, the service offering they provide uh, compared to OEMs at the price they offer um, is, is you know, proven in that way. Uh, yeah, and and the US acquisition as a risk, potentially? Sorry? And the US acquisition as, as a potential yeah, risk? So I, uh, I accept entirely that Australian companies generally have a very poor record of uh, acquiring companies uh, overseas, particularly in the US, and, and doing well out of them. Uh, that's certainly a risk. Um, and... Uh, what we've seen is that the CEO, Stephen Smith, has recently just gone to the US. So that, that is something that's provided further risk since buying them in early 2020. He hasn't been able to travel to the US like he would have otherwise uh, without COVID. Uh, it's only now that he's uh, going back there for the first time since the acquisition. And so, yes, uh, there may be some gremlins there. Uh, and I suspect because of COVID, uh, the first half may not be as uh, exciting as they had it hoped from the US, but uh, one of the reasons I'm invested in this company is because of, of Stephen, uh, who I think is an excellent manager. 
And one thing to look out for them, I think, over the next six months is, is announcements based on uh, perhaps deals that he's been able to do over there. So that the plan is to to engage with airlines in the Caribbean and that, other remote areas in uh, around the US and, and South America and uh, bring them into what's called an engine management program, which is uh, a program whereby airlines pay uh, a fixed cost for uh, uh, the ability to send their engines in and have them repaired at any time, um, which gives them certainty that uh, doesn't come with uh, suddenly having an engine blow up and then having to get a quote. Um, and that's, a just, segue, that's a good segue into, into the last question on PTV. Um, you know, what are some of the key announcements you're looking for? Obviously, we've got the results that are going to come out now in February, but if we, if, if we stretch it out maybe over, over the first six months of 2021, you know, what are some of the things you're looking for? Is it, you know, signing up decent sized customers that could be serviced by the US business um, or more customers on the Australian side uh, or, you know, improve, you know, I guess uh, improvements in the leasing and the parts businesses, you know, kind of global travel, you know, hopefully as we move to 2021 starts to pick up on a more broad based uh, setup. Sure. I mean, the company's given a, a financial guidance for the year, uh, which has benefited from the, the sale of a, um, a building they owned in, in Sydney, which uh, uh, that was another reason that I, I was drawn to the company. I knew that building was worth a lot more than was on the, the books and they've recently sold it for $9 million, having been on the books for three. Uh, so so the, the financials are sort of guided to. But yes, what I'm, what I'm looking for over the next six months is, uh, are they making some progress once the CEO is based in, in the US for the next six months? Uh, what they would be hoping to do, I imagine, is to sign some new airlines to, uh, if not leasing deals, which would be ideal, then certainly to engine management program contracts. Um, and that's important because the great benefit of the engine management program uh, for PDB is that it allows them uh, visibility over the workflow that's coming in uh, and that allows them to create massive efficiencies within the, the factory with staff uh, and, and shifts etc. Um, so, so that's what they're trying to do that the company called Prime Turbines they took over in the US uh, does actually offer that. Um, I mean it's fairly widely offered in the US that service but having uh, engines on a program can massively increase the efficiency of that company Prime Turbines. So yes I'm hoping to see um, some, some news flow from the they're a on hopefully uh, the engine management program. Uh, they also hope to build a uh, a leasing uh, book over time of either engines or planes, um, and that has the dual benefit, obviously, of the leasing income, but also the leases tend to be uh, conditional on the the engines uh, on the on the planes that are leased actually going through PTB's engine management program. Yeah, well, let's uh, move on to our, our second one, which is uh, Australian family law. And um, not knowing your background in law, I can uh, see why you might be attracted to the sector. But um, yeah, I mean, a relatively, I guess, new player uh, on the ASX. Um, you know, we've had plenty of kind of legal firms listed down through the years. Um, but maybe just give, give us an overview of, of uh, Australian family law and, and you know how they make their money and kind of where they sit in that kind of listed legal space. Sure I mean there's been a, a very hit and miss uh, history of listed legal firms and, and listed professional services firms so um, I can understand that people will be wary uh, of any such firm. Um, you're right it's a fairly uh, new company it was uh, entered the ASX about 18 months ago or less via a, uh, a reverse takeover um, into essentially a shell that used to be a mining company. Uh, it's a, a company that was uh, founded by a, a really quite young entrepreneurial guy um, called Edward Finn in Melbourne. Uh, and he, he started the business. His expertise, although he did have a, a law degree, he'd never been a lawyer and his expertise was not so much in, in the law, but in uh, uh, SEO or uh, search engine optimization, mm -hmm. and he had 
set up some small businesses that had done very well on that in terms of you know selling t-shirts and he decided to work out how he would apply that to the law uh and that and that that worked very well to the point that uh he he set up sydney and melbourne legal officers in family law he felt that was an area where um using that that expertise around using google search engines uh would allow him to um optimize uh, the the attracting of customers uh, and, and when it listed on the ASX, that's uh, essentially what it was, uh, Sydney and Melbourne, uh, you know, quite small legal operation. Um, what it's attracted me to the company is, is since then, um, they've uh, engaged a, a very experienced lawyer called Grant Dealove, who's now the chairman and CEO of the company. Uh, Ed Finn's still involved in the company, still the largest shareholder, uh, but he's, his role these days is confined to an advisory board which uh, focuses on the, the IT side of things. Uh, Grant, uh, I think for most people who meet him, uh, uh, comes across as a very impressive person uh, with, with quite a bit of gravitas. And, and that's something that I think is needed in the process of attracting lawyers to this firm. So it's uh, unlike perhaps a traditional model, which is a, a rollout, uh, sorry, a, a roll up, a purchasing of, of firms uh, that doesn't really work here in that um, you don't really want to see these firms uh, buying up the uh, you know small uh, legal practices where the, the practitioner is about to retire. It just doesn't work. What this company is doing as an expansion model is going into new uh, territories, new capital cities uh, and uh, making offers to the, the best, most talented family lawyers in those uh, areas uh, and attracting them because of the, uh, the freedom, the ability to build a practice uh, and the uh, resourcing that Australian Family Laws provides. And, and Grant is someone who is needed to do that. I mean, Edward, to his, uh, to his great credit, recognised that there was a point where the firm needed to, to have someone like that uh, if he was to, to truly um, uh, get some quality lawyers on board. And so that's that's where the firm is now. It's uh, now operating uh, because of the uh, work of, of Grant uh, in each uh, capital city in Australia. It's the first time there's ever been a, a group of family lawyers that have uh, uh, done that. Um, family law is essentially a cottage industry. Um, uh, but uh, this is the first time that a, a company has uh, uh, grown a national presence. Yeah, uh, and just maybe just to clarify for people, your typical family law practice, just you know, maybe hit three or four of the things that uh, you know they they'd be specialising in. I'm guessing, you know, divorces, custody, wills. Um, do they do estates uh, upon death? Is, is that kind of their bread and butter of a of a daily practice? Uh, they'd probably avoid wills and estates. They, um, they would probably pass that on. Uh, they, their specialties are in, in obviously uh, uh, separation, which doesn't have to be a divorce. Uh, uh, you know, obviously a large number of the uh, uh, separations that occur are from people who are not married or in de facto relationships and the, the legislation um, provides protections for those people as much as it does essentially for married people. And so there's an enormous market there of, of uh, people, um, uh, you know, extending to obviously same-sex couples um, who, uh, married or not, um, might require a family lawyer for, yes, as you pointed out, custody issues, which tend to be um, very emotional on occasions, uh, property uh, separation. The, the process of divorce itself, um, obviously, they deal with, uh, in the relevant cases. Uh, and the vast majority of cases they deal with don't end up going to court. Um, I mean, you must go through the court to an extent to, to uh, register property settlements and to register divorces per se, but uh, only maybe one or 2% of cases would end up in a full, uh, you know, TV style trial that you may be expecting. Um, most of it is, is negotiations uh, with other lawyers. And as you said, it's not really the roll-up strategy that we've seen with you know a lot of professional services firms. Um, 
you know, what is their kind of long term goal then in terms of, uh, you know, you said they've got a practice in each capital city, you know, do, do they think uh, that can grow to, you know, 40, 50 practices across Australia where, you know, Sydney has scope for five or six practices, you know, Adelaide might have scope for two practices, Perth maybe two practices is that, and, they, and, and they're just going to continue to try and attack talent for practices in specific geographic areas within these cities or, or into, you know, the, the bigger regional uh, centres. Yeah, that, that's right. It's a question I asked at the ABM actually at Grant. Uh, uh, there's, there's two ways that they can expand. One is geographically and the other is, and probably the most important though, is uh, that each of the individual offices that are already set up has scope to grow within themselves in terms of having more uh, junior practitioners, for instance, uh, in each of those offices that are already set up. Uh, although it's a national presence, each of the offices that are set up tend to be quite small. Sydney and Melbourne have, have quite a number of lawyers in them, but the others are presently quite small. So uh, it's a combination of growing the number of lawyers in each office, which obviously brings quite a great deal of efficiency. Uh, but then, yes, an example of the geographical expansion um, now that they've already set up in each city is that they recently uh, set up an office in Preston in, Mel in the Melbourne suburbs. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's an example of the type of satellite office that you're, you're speaking of. And, and that's uh, something that we'll see more of. I mean, the, the research that, that comes up, for instance, uh, that Edward does uh, uh, shows that a lot of uh, clients don't necessarily wish to travel a great deal of distance to see a family lawyer. So uh, although the, the present ones tend to be based in the CBD, uh, there's benefits from having actual family lawyers uh, physically present in the suburbs. Um, it's, it tends to be a, a fairly personal or emotional area of the law and, uh, and, and seeing practitioners face to face uh, and having them present nearby tends to be important. And yes, finally, um, larger regional areas would be another area of expansion for them as well. And it, some of the key risks around the, the businesses you see, is it their ability to attract talent and retain talent, is that, is that kind of key risk? Or, you know, is there, um, you know, something, something else that I, I can't kind of put my finger on now that, 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 to, the, to the untrained eye that, that, that you see as risk with, with kind of your law background? Uh, look, I think that's the main thing that you, you have touched on, like the ability to, to retain talent. I mean, we've seen, you know, the, professional service companies that the one of the most um, pronounced being the the IVF companies that have listed we've seen major problems from them having star doctors as it were uh, leaving and taking their clients with them or their reputations with them um, one point of difference here is that first of all those type of firms the larger law firms and and, and professional service firms have tended to come to the, the stock exchange once they were already quite established um, and, and that these uh, larger lawyers have built their reputation or doctors have built their reputations. In this case, there's still a very long runway for these uh, practitioners uh, before they, they reach that point and, and, and there's you know, benefits for shareholders to be obtained before uh, we get to that point. Um, that's something that's going to have to be dealt with down the track, though, I think, uh, once uh, these uh, uh, lawyers are, uh, have sufficient uh, following and, and uh, 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 significant enough in terms of their profitability of the firm. Uh, and that can be explored in, in various ways in terms of uh, incentives. Um, the uh, difference that you might see from other law firms is important, I think. One, uh, it's, it's a national area of law, for instance. So uh, the Family Law Act applies nationwide. So a lawyer practicing this area in Tasmania uh, is the same as uh, someone in Broome, uh, the same legislation, the same precedents, there's enormous efficiencies to be gained there compared to say uh, Shine or the other, um, Slater and Gordon or the other uh, personal injuries firms where each state has a different regime. Um, so that's one area of difference. The other is that we recently saw a failed uh, IPO from a, a very large corporate firm here in Australia. And I think another key difference is that in those type of firms, clients 
unnecessarily going to a particular lawyer. So uh, the firms obviously have have brands and, and, and spend a lot of time on those. But the reality is in the corporate world, people want to work with a particular lawyer. And if that lawyer packs up and leaves to go to another firm, they'll generally be able to take most of their clients with them. Australian family law, I think, is building a sufficient brand uh, that that um, won't be as big a risk. The other thing, of course, is that you don't tend to have repeat clients. Obviously, in the corporate world, uh, the clients keep coming back to the same lawyer, whereas in, in uh, family law, you, you generally, hopefully, for most people, only dealing with them on a on a single separation or, or one or two separations. So, it's not as important for the for the lawyer. Uh, to have that reputation, I suppose. Uh, I What attracts me in my central thesis of, of, of this when I bought it was that uh, if you go to say, and this goes back to my experience as a criminal lawyer and knowing other lawyers, there is a vast diversity in the quality of law that's practiced out there. And to the average person who doesn't know lawyers, uh, they can be fortunate or, or they can be very unfortunate uh, to get you know, a poor lawyer who might be out there. Um, one thing that brands in law create, say, Slater and Gordon, if you go to Slater and Gordon, you know you may not get the best PI lawyer in Australia, but you know you're definitely not going to get it the worst. You're going to get a good level of service. Mm. Uh, and if you don't know a lawyer, you don't, can't get a personal recommendation, that's where you go. There's nothing like that in family law. Uh, it's a cottage industry, each uh, firm has a small number of practitioners and they really only try to focus on their local area. By having a national brand, uh, there's a great ability, I think, to attract the, the, the vast majority of people who, who don't have connections to the law and can't get a recommendation to a decent lawyer. Yeah, and the, and the benefits of the brand is, you know, you can, I guess, funnel, funnel leads uh, more efficiently with marketing campaigns that, you know, it just ends up going to you know, the, the geographic practice that, that best fits the, the inquiry. And, you know, there's a lot, uh, I think, uh, you know, that can be achieved there. Look, two, two great stocks, I think, uh, two that are, um, you know, I would say off a lot of people's uh, radar. Um, if they're not, uh, I guess, fishing down the small end of micros and even within micros, as I've always said, you know, it's such a it's such a big pond. It's it's hard to keep track of uh, all of the fish in there, <laughs> where they are, what's happening with them, what's the what's the story. So thanks for that, Peter. Listen, um, if anybody wants to get in touch with you on uh, the West Ferry Fund, um, what's the the best way to get in touch with you uh, to find out more? Uh, they can email me at uh, Peter at westferry.com.au. Uh, you'll see if you go to westferry.com.au, the website that uh, we're still in the process of getting it up and running, but but it does have all of my contact details there in terms of phone number and, and email as well. But uh, I'm very happy to, to talk to anyone about um, small cap stocks. I'll uh, happily do that, or especially micro cap stocks. I'm happy to uh, do that for, for uh, periods that are way longer than perhaps they even would want me to. But and then, uh, that's why I call the uh, this uh, coffee micro caps because is uh, I love I'm the same I love nothing better than grabbing a coffee and talking stocks for probably way too longer than is uh, an efficient use of time. <laughs> but um, Peter, listen, thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, on the latest uh, interview in this series. And um, yeah, we we'll look forward to tracking how uh, West Ferry goes uh, over the course of 2021. That's great. Thanks very much, Mark. No problem. Thanks, Peter.